President Kennedy and civil rights. The subtopic today is the Kennedy administration's stand on civil rights. Now, I told you yesterday that when President Kennedy took office, he strongly believed the federal government should pass laws to guarantee equal rights for Negroes, right? We did say that. And that was not the consensus of most Americans, especially white Americans, and especially white Americans that lived in the Deep South. Now, you remember that civil rights was a major campaign issue during the campaign in 1960. Kennedy openly criticized the Eisenhower administration and Vice President Nixon for standing pat for not doing enough in the area of civil rights. And he'll become the first president that will believe the federal government should actually pass laws to guarantee equal rights for Negroes. Now, I didn't tell you this is an interesting story. You remember in the election of 1960, there are 18 million Negroes in this country. And who got most of the Negro vote? John Kennedy. That might not have been the case. I'm going to tell you a story. When this race first started, Martin Luther King Sr., Martin Luther King Jr.'s father, who had a lot of influence in the black community of this country, was a supporter of Richard Nixon, not John Kennedy. Why? Now, I really want you to think about this, because remember, Martin Luther King Jr. and his father, for that matter, stood for non-discrimination. You should not discriminate on a, a person by virtue of their race. What is so ironic about the fact that Martin Luther King a senior supported Nixon at first. Was it because of uh, Kennedy's faith? Yeah. He did not want a Catholic president. He's going to discriminate against Catholics because he doesn't want a Catholic president. Yet he doesn't want you to discriminate against Negroes. But he was as discriminatory as anybody else because he did not want a Catholic president. He was against that. He wasn't Catholic, right? Their, their religion is not Catholic. Okay? What turned the corner is what we will be talking about later. What happens in one of the many civil rights protest marches that Martin Luther King Jr. and the SCLC are involved in, several times they are thrown in jail because they are violating the law at that time on segregation because segregation was legal, right? So... Martin Luther King gets thrown in jail again, and this time it's not very positive. His safety is at risk, okay, which became a, a, a point. Who called and made arrangements to get him released? Kennedy. John Kennedy did, in a way. We'll tell you that. And all of a sudden, what did Martin Luther King Sr. think? And Kennedy's all right. And that's when he threw his support behind JFK in this election. If this incident doesn't happen, which we'll talk about in a bit, there's a good chance that Nixon gets the Negro vote and he's the President of the United States. Remember how close that election was? So that was an interesting fact. So support that Kennedy received from Martin Luther King Sr. proved to have made a huge difference in that political political election. Okay? All right, now I'm going to give you three things that President Kennedy did early in his administration to try to improve the civil rights issue. Okay, three things that President Kennedy did early in his administration to try to improve the civil rights issue. First of all, he established the Committee on Equal Employment Opportunity. He established the Committee on Equal Employment Opportunity. Also known as the CEEO. Now basically what the Committee on Equal Employment Opportunity did is it ensured that businesses or companies that worked for the federal government gave every person, no matter their race, an equal opportunity for employment. So the president could control those businesses or those organizations or companies that work for the federal government. And he could say, if you're going to work for the federal government, then you're going to hire on the base of ability, not race. 
So that's what this committee did. The Committee on Equal Employment Opportunity, also known as the CEEO, ensured that business com businesses or companies that worked for the federal government gave every person, no matter their race, an equal opportunity to job. He can only control those that the government controls. Does that make sense? Okay, he couldn't control hotels and restaurants. Now, if these hotels and restaurants work for the government somehow, in other words, if only government employees stayed there, which is a stretch, I'm just making an example, then he could control them, but otherwise he couldn't. So this is how he tried. So that's the first thing he did, is he established the CEEO, an organization that made sure that any businesses or companies that work for the federal government gave every person, no matter their race, an equal opportunity for employment. Another big problem that had to be solved was getting black people in the South to what? Vote. Okay? So he directed Robert Kennedy, his brother, the Attorney General, at the Justice Department to make sure that they supported efforts of getting more blacks to vote in the South. At this time in history, very few blacks were exercising their right to vote, especially in the Deep South. Why weren't they voting? They were afraid of what? Repercussion and violence. They were encouraged strongly not to vote. Okay? So John Kennedy could see this, and the second thing he did early in his administration to help with civil rights is he told his brother Bobby, listen, you and the Department of Justice need to make sure that those black voters, eligible voters in the South, are protected and are encouraged to go to the polls without fear of repercussion or violence. That's your job. Make sure you go down in the, there and monitor that. Okay? Make sure they go to the polls. Now what might be another reason administratively that you could improve civil rights in your cabinet? Appoint black, appoint black people or Negroes to your cabinet. And here are three examples of people that John F. Kennedy appointed to his cabinet of, of Negro descent. First of all, he named a fellow, I've got him right over here, I've got to find him, right here. Carl T. Rowan, this fellow right here, was named U.S. Ambassador to Finland. Carl T. Rowan was named U.S. Ambassador to Finland. You know who that thrilled in the old days? Saskia. Remember Saskia Perillo? Or a student, she was from Finland, and so she took pride in the fact that John Kennedy appointed a Negro as U.S. Ambassador to her home country of Finland. So he named Carl T. Rowan to the position of the United States Ambassador to Finland. Now I noticed I spelled the next name wrong on your ID sheet, so please correct it. He appointed Andrew Hatcher, it should be an H instead of a K, Andrew Hatcher as Associate Press Secretary. He appointed Andrew Hatcher, H-A-C-H-E-R, as Associate Press Secretary. So what did he do for a living, Kyra? If he's Associate Press Secretary, what did he do? To Pierre Salinger. Very good. He became an assistant to Pierre Salinger. He was under the supervision of Pierre Salinger. Was a position they probably needed? Not really, but hey, did, did Salinger treat him? Very well, yeah. yeah, very well, yeah. Now the one that you will probably recognize is Kennedy appointed Thurgood Marshall to serve on the U.S. Court of Appeals, which means he isn't what yet? A Supreme Court Justice. He will eventually become the first African American or Negro to serve on the Supreme Court. Kennedy gives him his start by appointing Thurgood Marshall to serve as a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals. From there, where will he go? Eventually to the Supreme Court. Okay, So that was a good move. So those are some things that Kennedy did to try to improve civil rights early in his administration. He's got big plans, but he's not going to live to see it. He was U.S. Ambassador to Finland. Like, like, uh, like, uh, Gromyko was a dip, or uh, not, uh, Anatoly Dobrin was a U.S. U.S. Excuse me, Russian ambassador to the U.S. This guy was a U.S. ambassador to Finland. Same we time. have one for every country. Pretty much. Yeah. Uh, when we go to Georgetown, there you will see the Ukrainian embassy that's right in Georgetown, where the U.S. ambassador to the Ukraine, or the Ukra Ukrainian ambassador to the U.S. That's where he lives. Okay. 
Pretty much. Any any country that we have any foreign relations with. Okay? Yeah. Um, our next subtopic is very important. It's early struggles in the civil rights movement. And what I'm going to do basically is give you seven major events that happened in the United States during the Kennedy administration, none which were too positive. Okay? So during the presidency of John F. Kennedy, there were seven major events that happened in the United States concerning the civil rights issue. And I'm going to give you and explain all seven. One of the events, kind of a prelude, is what? It was more positive. No? The March on Washington is going to be one of these events, for example. But we'll get to that in a bit. So event number one occurred in 1961. It's on your ID sheet. and involved a group called the Freedom Riders. So event number one of early struggles in the civil rights movement, civil rights movement will occur in 1961, and it will involve the Freedom Riders. Anybody know what Freedom Riders were at the time? Motorcycles? Nope. What they make? What were they made up of? Civil rights supporters, activists. But but people don't understand that they were not all black. Many many of these people that were involved in the SCLC and the civil rights marches were black and white members. So the Freedom Riders were a group that consisted of both black and white members of the civil rights movement. Most people think everybody that protested was black. That was not true. There were many, many, many whites that joined the civil rights movement. Now, what happened in 1961 is this group known as the Freedom Riders set out and traveled to the Deep South to protest Jim Crow laws, asking for change. So this group of white and black civil rights advocates, in 1961, they set out and traveled to the Deep South to protest those Jim Crow Crow laws we talked about, asking for change. And this was going to be a peaceful protest. And the first example was this group of Freedom Riders traveled in Greyhound buses from Birmingham, Alabama to Montgomery, Alabama. So the first example of these Freedom Riders, this peaceful protest, is when they traveled in Greyhound buses from Birmingham, Alabama to Montgomery, Alabama. And they, again, they were protesting Jim Crow laws. Which one specifically do you think they were protesting if they took Greyhound buses? Bus segregation, buses. Bus segregation not on the buses so much, but inside the Greyhound bus stations. What did you see inside the Greyhound bus stations? Signs like this and signs like this, all Jim Crow laws, and they were protesting that. If you went into a Greyhound bus station in those days, blacks sat here, whites sat here. Blacks went to the bathroom there, whites went to the bathroom there. Drinking fountains as you see, entrances, etc. And so these civil rights workers, known as the Freedom Riders, rode Greyhound buses from Birmingham, Alabama to Montgomery, Alabama, peacefully protesting these Jim Crow laws in these bus stations. You guys are too young to know anything about Greyhound. When I was your age, it wasn't unusual if you didn't have a car and you lived in Forsyth, Montana, to take the Greyhound bus to visit your buddies from Forsyth to Billings. It stopped at the Howdy Hotel in Forsyth, picked you up at a certain time, dropped you off at the Greyhound bus station. There's still a Greyhound bus station in Billings today, right downtown on 27th Street, what, by the big bank there. Uh, there's, a, there's a bus station. There's still one there today. You can go and see. Okay. Well, when the Freedom Riders arrived in Birmingham to board those Greyhound buses, before they ever left, they were beaten and harassed. So when the Freedom Riders arrived in Birmingham to board the Greyhound buses that would have taken them to Montgomery, Alabama, they were beaten and harassed. Not much. 
Now, despite the violence and the injuries that they suffered, the Freedom Riders were determined to carry on their peaceful protest to Montgomery. So even though they were beaten up and harassed at the bus station on their way there, they still were determined they were going to get on that Greyhound bus and travel to Montgomery and do their protest. So, you're a bus driver who drives for Greyhound, and you are on this bus waiting to take this group of Freedom Riders from Birmingham to Montgomery, and you witness these people getting the heck beat out of them. Right? What would your philosophy be when they tried to get on the next time? I'm not sure I want to drive that bus, but you know what I mean? And you'll understand in a minute. So after this violence in Birmingham, no bus driver that was employed by the Greyhound Bus Company wanted to take the risk or responsibility to drive these buses with these Freedom Riders from Birmingham to Montgomery. Nobody, they couldn't get a bus driver. Couldn't find another one to do it. Now, by law, Providing a bus driver was the responsibility of the Greyhound Bus Company. All passengers have the right by law to public transportation if they pay for it. But the Greyhound Bus Company can't find a driver that will drive. They're going to break the law because these people paid for transportation and they deserve to have it by law. This gets so crazy, who has to get involved? Kennedy. Not which one? Who? Kennedy. Which one? Bobby. Bobby Kennedy. The Attorney General has to get involved. That's how bad this is. And he calls the Greyhound Bus Company personally, and he demands that they provide drivers for the Freedom Riders. He demands it. That goes all the way to the Attorney General. Crazy, but true. So they're saying no, 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 no. And finally, Bobby Kennedy personally calls the Greyhound Bus Company and said, Listen, you will, by law, provide a bus driver for those people. They paid for transportation. You'll give it to them. And the bus company complied with the Attorney General's request, and they finally got drivers to drive the buses. Okay? Now, if you're Bobby Kennedy, what are you thinking in the back of your mind? I went ahead and got forced them to get bus drivers. What would be your concern? Well, what's going to happen when they get to Montgomery? They got the heck beat out of them. They got the heck beat out of them. In Birmingham, what's going to happen in Montgomery? So if you're Bobby Kennedy, you might want to have some eyes on the ground so you know what's going on there. And what Bobby Kennedy did is he sent John Siegenthaler, who was a member of his Justice Department, to travel to Montgomery to observe the Freedom Riders when they arrived. And he had one of these, which was kind of unusual at that time, he had a direct phone line, so to speak, back to the Attorney General's office so he could report to him what was going on. So Bobby Kennedy was nervous about what was going to happen in Montgomery, so he sends John Siegenthaler, a member of his Justice Department, to travel to Montgomery to observe the Freedom Riders' arrival. And he wanted to report back directly to his office in Washington, D.C., what was going on. So Siegenthaler doesn't get on the bus, he drives his own car, because the car is equipped with a phone, so to speak, in those days, that was kind of a weird big deal. And he was going to report back to Bobby Kennedy in D.C. what was going on. Well, the bus arrives in Montgomery. And when the Freedom Riders get off, they're greeted by a large mob as they get off the bus. And they are immediately assaulted and beaten with clubs and baseball bats and fists. And it's an ugly, ugly, ugly scene. These Freedom Riders are pushed, kicked, punched, hit with baseball bats, hit with crude clubs. And all of this violence is going on as local police officers and FBI agents simply stand and watch. Why would they do that? Because segregation is what in Alabama? Legal. So the police officers don't step in, they just sit there and watch this. Well, they're Trump, but they're, they are violating city laws in Montgomery by protesting segregation because segregation is legal. They could have arrested them all, but we'll get to that. So they're beating them up, FBI's watching on, police is watching on. What? This is the South in the 1960s. Era. So they're just going to throw the First yeah. Amendment out the window? Yeah, and they're flying Confederate flags everywhere, just so you know. 
Now, what do you do if you're John Siegenthal? He's watching this situation get completely out of control, and he finally can't take it anymore, so he actually gets out of his car and tries to provide some assistance to these freedom riders. So he's witnessing this, and he's reporting it back to Bobby Kennedy. And finally, he decides he needs to do something, and he tries to provide assistance, and during that try, he himself was pushed to the ground and beaten with clubs and kicked and everything else. He was trying to help. Now, if you want to know what treatment you got, why you wouldn't want to drive a bus, here's a John Siegenthaler signature, very, very rare. Here's he and Bobby Kennedy here, and here's what a, the treatment one of the buses got that was traveling during these freedom rides. The bus is on fire. Okay, so this is what he dealt with. Now, Bobby, that John Th Siegenthaler left that line open during the time he went to provide assistance, and so Bobby's hearing all this mass confusion and violence on the telephone. And he gets so angry, who does he call and ask for an explanation of why FBI agents stood and did nothing? He calls the head of the FBI, which is uh, J. Edgar Hoover. So Bobby Kennedy is so furious of what's going on, including the beating of his own staff member, that he calls FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover personally and asks him for an explanation of the actions of the FBI agents assigned to Montgomery during the event, why they would stand by and allow that to happen. So there's your first event that occurred during the Kennedy administration. Wait, what?